Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe that today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be part of. We hope to see you this Sunday morning here at City Life. Oh, it's a good morning. Well, we are on this wonderful series, Hot Sundays in the Summer. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, it is kind of getting hot in here. Whew. Oh, okay. Well, this is my husband, JD. I am Joy. We have been married actually for almost 14 years. Um, we are by no means experts, but we are students, and we are students of relationships, and we have been uh, throughout our whole relationship. We just love to read books and take courses and do counseling and um, just learn lots. So we just believe that God has something to share today through us and that we have something we can all learn, even us. And so we're going to just jump right in. So modern culture, modern Western culture has many opinions on this topic of conversation and loves to tell us what their opinions are. And we see in, in sitcoms and movies and even advertisements, what our culture's views on sex and relationships are. We know it's all over the place. And what they seem to love to t tell us is that sex with strangers is exhilarating, right? You can't even make it up to the hotel room. The elevator seems like a great place. This is just so, so passionate. But married sex, apparently is mundane and monotonous if it happens at all, right? That's what culture tells us anyway. They tell us that sex is only physical, and if you're hungry, you would eat. So, go for it. <laughs> and another view about sex that's maybe been the traditional view of the church is that sex is dirty and sex is inappropriate to speak about, and so if you have to do it, go ahead, but we don't talk about this. And so we just, that's why we talk about sex in church, is because we need a place to speak about this thing that God has created in a healthy, life-giving, biblical way. And so we're going to talk about sex. And last week, Jen and Jeremy spoke together, and they talked about God's way and that God's way works. And it was so good. And this week, we are talking about prioritizing passion. You know, when we have an opinion about something, it's just that. It's an opinion. Yeah. But when God has an opinion, we call it something entirely different. We call it truth. Because he created sex, and his opinion on the matter is more than just an opinion. It's more than just a perspective. It's more than just what our culture says. It is truth. And we measure all other opinions against his truth. And we find that in the Bible. So we're going to look at some scripture today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6 Verses 12 to 13, it said, uh, Paul is responding to some questions from the Corinthian church. And so he says, I can hear some of you saying, for me, all things are permitted, but face the facts, not all things are beneficial. So you say, for me, all things are permitted. Here's my response. He says, I will not allow anything to control me. And another chimes in, food is for the stomach and the stomach is for the food. And what they're doing when he's quoting this, this is actually common sayings in their culture viewing sexuality. So food is for the stomach, stomach is for the food. I suppose so. But in a day, uh, a day will come when God will dispense of both, both food and the stomach. And he sums up this by saying, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is overall and he cares about your body. So Paul is showing that God's opinion is different than their culture's opinions, whether it's that all things are permitted and I can do whatever I want with my body, which sounds a lot like our culture, actually. And an, or another opinion, sex is just an appetite. It's meaningless. It's just filling my body with what I need. But God's opinion, or the truth on this, is that the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is overall, and he cares about your body. And it goes on, or it says it in another translation. It says, since the master honors you with a body, honor him with your body. So honor God with your body. What does that mean? You know, if you are married here today, can you put your hands up? I want to see how many people in the room are married. Okay, 
Lots of married people. And if you're single, you're here today, you're single, you are not married. Put your hand up. Okay, so if you want, you can take a look around. <laughs> Maybe lock eyes with someone across the room. So the goal for all of us, married and single, is to honor God with our body. So we are going to look at what does that mean, the different stages of life. JD's going to talk to the singles for a minute, and then I'm going to come back and talk to the married people. Mm -hmm. So, dear single people, yeah, I want to talk with you. And if you're not single, hey, you can take notes because you either know someone who is single or maybe you'll have kids one day and kids start out single, so you can... <laughs> <laughs> Singleness, I'd also like to say from the start, singleness is not like a transition period, like, oh, I have to suffer through singleness until I, until I find someone. Um, that's not really the right perspective. If you are single, celebrate it. It's, you are not weird or strange because you don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend or you're not hooking up or whatever. That you, even if the world would like to tell you that, that's not true. Being single is great. And for some of you, that might be your life. And you're like, I'm good, actually. I'm good being single, and I'm just going to do this. That's fine. Some of you, it's like, I hope to find somebody someday, but for now, I'm going to enjoy where I'm at. You should enjoy where you're at. So it's not a transition period, but we want to talk today about, yeah, prioritizing passion. And so if you are single here today, I just want to say, first off, off, right off the bat, the number one way that you can prioritize, and the number one thing you should prioritize your passion towards is intimacy with God. Man, when you just say, God is my number one, yeah. which sounds like a good thing to say in church, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, very serious. When you are just decide, my passion first and foremost is prioritized towards God. I will focus on him. He's the focus of my life. That will bleed down into everything else. It'll bleed down into whatever relationships, friendships, dating, whatever um, that you have along the way. And let me just say as well, uh, um, a, a man or a woman who is very passionate about God, that is a very attractive thing to the right kind of person that is also pursuing God. And it's like, dang, that, I, like, I like where that person's headed. Maybe, maybe we'll merge. We'll see. <laughs> but the biggest thing is fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's just, I'm going to focus on you, God. You are the purpose of why I'm here. And that is so great. And so maybe you're single and you're doing that. Um, did you know that you are blessed? The Bible says you are blessed by being single. I'll even show you. This is, this is great. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 34, it says, A single man can focus on the things of the Lord and how to please the Lord, but a married man has to worry about the details of the here and now and how to please his wife. A married man will always have divided loyalties. So they're not saying that one's right or one's wrong. They're just saying, hey, you've got extra responsibilities or extra commitments or extra focuses you have to take once you're married. So if you're single, celebrate it. You can like just focus on God. You can focus on being the, becoming the person God wants you to be in this time. So being single, it has its advantages. Uh, but today we're not talking just relationships as a whole. We're honing it in and we're talking about sex. And so whether you are single and waiting, single and active, uh, wherever you are at, we want to talk about this area in your life because sex is very important for us to understand regardless of where we're at. And so understanding sex starts with really understanding God's view of it. And 1 Timothy 4.4 4 says this, for everything God made is good. Yeah. For what? Everything. everything. Everything God made is good. Yeah. God made sex, therefore God views sex as good. Yeah. And so will I. I will, that will be my perspective, which means I will not discredit it. I will not downplay it. I will not make dirty jokes about it. I will not turn it into something else. It shouldn't be because it's too powerful. It's too incredible. It's too life altering for good or bad. It can be, there's power in it. And it's the fire that when contained and used properly will bring warmth, will bring comfort, but it can also be the fire that if you just let it rage out of control will burn and destroy in your life. So, single people, how do you honor God? Like we're saying, how do we honor God with our body? You honor God with your body by waiting. Oh, that word, waiting, what? No, because our culture is very much about like, I don't want to wait for anything. Give me, give me now. I'm the microwave culture. I want it quicker, quicker. You stand in front of the microwave and you're just like, no, I can't even let it get to zero right now. It's like two seconds left and you punch it, take it out. It's good enough, right? 
It's just like, it's, it's who we are. So waiting isn't something we typically embrace. But if you would embrace in this area of your life, I promise the rewards are huge. And that's part of growing up. Part of growing up is we've been talking about just what God is doing with us individually and as a church, as we mature and grow and learn, with that comes discipline. And Monica talked about discipline a, a few weeks back. Really, really great, really important. But discipline is such an important part. And here's a way that you can choose discipline in your life. It's choosing what I want most over what I want now. We got a lot of things we want right now, but I'm going to choose in every situation I'm in or whatever, I'm going to choose what do I want most. Big picture, down the road, I'm looking at this, even though it's hard in the moment to think that way. The more that you just decide ahead of time, when you get in that moment of now, yes, I want this now, but I want this most. And I'm going to pick this. And singles, that is a great way to look at this. Because instead of just saying, I want this now, obviously God put urges and desires in our bodies. He wired us to have sexual appetites, yet he's saying, I've also equipped you to be able to wait. I've equipped you to be able to get to where you need to be to thoroughly enjoy what I want to give you when the time is right. There's a whole book devoted to sex in the Bible. Song of Solomon, very racy. And one of my favorite verses is uh, 8.4. It says, I charge you. This is what he's saying to us. I charge you not to excite your love until it is what? Ready. Ready. Don't stir a fire in your heart too soon until it is ready to be satisfied. And so the author is telling us, it's like, hey, at some point, yes, your love will be excited. At some point, yes, that fire in your heart will be stirred and be able to be something incredible. But don't do it until you're ready. Yes, this is a gift. Yes, it is amazing. But hey, 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 just a second. Wait. Just, just trust me on this. Wait. The Bible holds sex in a very high regard, celebrates it in its purest form, but it also warns us to wait until the time or the season or the person is right. And by the way, that's not really meant to be open to interpretation, right? It's like, mm, I'm pretty sure this is the right person or this feels like the right time. The Bible's like, whoa, 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 whoa. There is a right time, a right person or whatever. Like, there is a right situation. It's not just something you decide in the moment. Waiting until marriage is the only relationship. This isn't just like the biblical right thing to do, but it's actually the only relationship that can harness and, con and contain the power of sex. It's what God's designed it for, and that's where it's meant to be. And the Bible views sex so highly that it cannot be shared casually. It can't be. So I have an example. Who loves chicken? Chicken? Chicken people? Mmm. Who could go for some chicken right now? Maybe you'll have chicken for lunch. Okay, are you hungry for chicken? If I had some chicken for you, who would want to eat some chicken right now? Right? Okay. Well, I have some chicken here for you, and I'm just wondering who would love to have a bite of chicken right now. Do I got any takers? Michelle? No? no. What? It's chicken. It's chicken. You said you were hungry for chicken. I want chicken. Why can't? What's wrong with me eating this chicken right now? It's not ready. It's not ready. Yeah. This is something designed for me to consume. <laughs> this is something I want, but I need to wait until it's ready and I'm ready so that I can actually put this to good use in my body and have it benefit my life and not make things worse. That is even the same with sex where we could, we could just grab it right now, but with that can come consequences when you are not ready or you have not come into the place where God has designed it to absolutely benefit your life. And so that's what we got to realize is that the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. There, will, there can be a right time, singles, if that's where you're going to end up. But to experience God's best, we're going to have to choose what you want most over what you want now. It's choosing that. It's saying, you know what? Right now I want to Netflix and chill, <laughs> but what I want more is to have a healthy relationship free from compromises and regrets. I want to click on this site right now, but what I want more is untainted eyes so that when I get married, I'm not comparing to this person that I now have. It's saying, right now I want to date so I don't feel lonely. It's a legitimate feeling, but what I want more is to focus on becoming the best God can make me to be so I'm ready, if that happens, to be the best for whoever that person's going to be. 
got to choose what you want most or what you want now. And the honest truth is both choices are going to be painful. They just are. But I can tell you that I don't regret a single boundary that Joy and I put in place to help us wait. You don't, if healthy boundaries, you'll never look back and be like, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. You'll be glad you did, even if it felt limiting for a time. But that's why we're going to prioritize our passion because passion unchecked is dangerous. But healthy boundaries will allow passion to grow properly. You set up some good healthy boundaries in your single life, you will, you will allow passion to grow at the pace it's supposed to be at and let it get there. So just some suggestions, take them for what it's worth. It's things I've seen working in other people's lives, our own, whatever. It's, it's the little things like, you know what, if you're single, maybe don't hang out alone with the opposite sex. Like really, you don't need to. It's like, I'm gonna hang out in groups and get to know people better anyways. But when you just hang out, it's like just you and her or just you and him, you're, you're, you're making it that much easier for a compromise to happen. No matter how strong you think you are. Why would you put yourself in a situation where it's just that much easier to compromise? Just say, create good, healthy boundaries when it comes to that. It's setting limits and standards for things like time, touch, and talking. And you're like, what? Why, why would I need to do that? You don't need to, but there is such health when you do that and you say, you know what? We're, I'm, at this point in our relationship or before we're dating, I'm not, I might not have this amazing conversation with you because, hey, um, girls are very emotional and sometimes you bearing your soul to her it's kind of like her flashing you. <laughs> Seriously, like it just like it locks something. It creates something that maybe you're not ready to create. And so there's just things like that, whether it comes to time or touch or talking. It's, it's setting up healthy boundaries. And those things take work and it takes effort and it can hurt. So pick your pain because you will either choose the pain of discipline or you will experience the pain of regret. You either choose the pain of discipline, oh, this is hard, but it's worth it, or you will experience the pain of regret, which lasts a whole lot longer. So you, you honor God, and you will reap lifelong benefits when you wait for what you want most instead of giving in to what you want now. I'll keep going. So good. So that is the goal for all of us, is God honoring relationships, honoring God with our body, with our sexuality. So how many of you love um, fortune cookies? Can I throw out some fortune cookies? Anybody want a snack? Snack, anyone? Come on. Woo! Woo! That almost hit the roof. So fortune cookies. Okay, how many of you have ever done where you, like, read the fortune and add a little clause at the end? It's like... You, you will discover. What? Sorry, Ray. <laughs> Stop it. Okay. Hopefully it didn't hurt too much. They're pretty light. Okay, so the fortunes inside. They might say something like, you will discover hidden talents. And do you ever like add the little claws on at the end of whatever your fortune says? Yep. What do we add on? In bed. In bed. <laughs> Practice makes perfect in bed. Okay, so if you are looking for what the Bible says about sex, get creative and apply this principle to your favorite Bible verse. <laughs> <laughs> Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In bed. John 10.10, 10, Jesus came to give us life, rich and satisfying life. In bed. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Yes. Okay, so, see, the Bible is helpful for your sex life. It's good. But truthfully, we don't even really need to create verses about sex because there is so much good stuff about sex in the Bible that will benefit and build your relationship. So 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 4 says, Now, getting down to the questions you asked in your letter. First, is it a good thing to have sexual relations? So all these new Christians are wondering, do we still get to have sex? It's a good question. And Paul answers, he answers and he says, certainly, but only within a certain context. See, we're not making this stuff up. It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but a marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife and the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Marriage is not a place to stand up for your own rights. Marriage is a decision to serve the other, whether in bed or out. 
So basically, what do we learn from this scripture? If you are married, you should be having sex regularly. Preach it. (laughs) And not as a means of manipulation, but as a place of mutual serving one another. You should be having sex regularly. And it goes on to say that there are times that you can agree upon a break. Maybe it's after having a baby. There's a time to take a break. Yes. But the whole purpose of this is that our strong sex drives actually give us an opportunity to give. And so if you are the one in your relationship maybe who has a lesser sex drive, it's an opportunity to give. And you two as a couple get to determine what regularly means to you. Okay? So you <laughs> and in different seasons of marriage, you might find that your roles are reversed from what is typical in a man and a woman's relationship. But it's important to just keep the lines of communication open. There might be differences in desire or medical issues or recovering, maybe even from past decisions or some sexual abuse that has happened in the past. Maybe there's a time for some for a break, but it, the goal is that we are actually using sex to serve one another and to strengthen your relationship, to strengthen your spouse when they're weak. That actually, purity in marriage is not abstinence. Purity in marriage is a relationship that you find sexual fulfill- fulfillment in your spouse alone, free from pornography and lustful thoughts and other sexual sin. You know, those don't disappear on your wedding day, but you actually have an opportunity as a couple to create a safe place um, for those sexual drives. And sex is a tool that can actually be used to affair-proof your marriage. It's not a guarantee, but it can be used as a tool to make sure that you guys' connection is stronger than any connection you'd have with anyone else. Uh, So making passion a priority. In marriage, this means we need to just make this the goal for our relationship. Make time for it. Time management coaches often talk about the, the problem or the danger of allowing the urgent to overtake the important. And although passion in your marriage is important, oftentimes the urgent become, um, you know, a time when, you know, you put passion on the back, back burner. Things like work urgent deadlines or even small children or sick children, you know, the urgent can overtake the important. And over time, Doing that and continually putting it on the back burner means that the spark between you that actually builds connection is slowly fading. So regardless of where you're at in your marriage, I think one way we can make passion a priority is to continue to pursue each other, to continue to spend time. You know, don't just switch into autopilot, but continue to pursue one another. Initiate times of connection in and out of the bedroom. You know, sometimes it's the small things every day, the thoughtful things, the helpful things that actually build towards a passionate sex life. Be intentional. Set time for this. You know, for the longest time, our version of Netflix and chill was throw on Netflix for the kids and run upstairs and lock the door. Uh, Yeah. Go, go, go. It's it's good. (laughs) But, and honestly, if you are in a season of of small children, I need to just say this because oftentimes children become the most urgent in your life, right? And it can overtake the priority of your spouse. And I've heard women say this before. You know, he's a grown man. My children need me. And it sounds noble, but it's so messed up because this connection is for life. And parenting is a temporary assignment from God. And it is meant to be temporary, but I still have to like this guy long after my kids are gone. And so we need to continue to build that connection. And that means that I, as a mom, need to prioritize my spouse over my kids. So keep pursuing each other, prioritize. Um, You know, sex is often like a box of Lego. Bear with me, I know. (laughs) 
You know, as a kid, maybe you, your kids have Lego and they see that box and they think, I want that toy. That looks so fun. But then they open the box and there's bags with little pieces and it's like, what is this? And, but they learn to discover that the joy of Lego is building. It's following the directions and building something cool and eventually you have a great thing that you can play with. But at first, oh, and then, you know, each kid, it, most of them never stay like that. They take them apart and build something else. It's the joy of building and the joy of creating. We know that's the, what's made Lego eternally popular. And, you know, so oftentimes, even in sex, you know, we get this expectation. We've maybe had a picture painted to us of what sex should look like. And then we open it up and we experience maybe a little bit of disappointment at what it is. And maybe sex has disappointed you. Maybe it's created more conflict in your marriage than intimacy. Or maybe it's created more pain than pleasure. You know, honestly, we've had periods of our marriage and just being completely vulnerable. We've had periods in our marriage when I was like, hey, God, wasn't this supposed to be a gift? Can I return it? Because it seems to be broken over here. Like, no, it's not really the way I expected it to be. And you know, honestly, regardless of the frustration or the difficulty that you may have experienced in physical intimacy, the truth is that the gift of sex is a gift for building. It's a gift for taking the pieces that you've been given and building something brand new, creating and creating something with your spouse that God created to connect you. Come on up, babe. <laughs> I, uh, I just wanted to take a moment and talk specifically to the married men. Um, as we were preparing this, I, I felt like God just put this idea in my head. It's like, share this. And I was like, oh, I don't know. That's a little awkward, but, but I think it could be good. And so um, I feel like I just want to encourage the married men in a specific area, something I have never heard shared before. Um, not that it's necessarily unique to me or this thought, but uh, it's kind of strange. And so this is for every married man in the room, okay? So if you're single or dating or living together, I'm sorry, this does not apply to you, okay? And here's why. Here's why. Because marriage between a man and a woman is the only thing strong enough to contain the power of sex, and it's also the only relationship where God blesses sex. Man and woman married, God says, that is, that is the context, that is the relationship that I will bless your sex life. And so I want to speak specifically to those guys because that is for you. And here's the thing, as a Christ follower, you have the Holy Spirit, Okay, so married men, if you follow Christ, you have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit in you. And the Bible tells us this in John 14. It says, the Father is sending a great helper, the Holy Spirit, in my name to teach you everything and to remind you of all I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is a helper here to teach you about everything. <laughs> everything. The Holy Spirit wants to be involved and build something amazing. And, and maybe right away you're like, um, that's super weird. God wants to be like in the mix of this thing. And you, you know, I even think when I first went to high school art class, first day, the art teacher was like, okay, we're going to be doing nude portraits. If you have a problem with this, if you can't be mature about it, just leave. <laughs> and I was like, huh, okay. And I think God almost wants to encourage the same way. It's like, come on, don't think about it as some weird goofy, immature way. Yeah. God wants to be a part of every part of our life. Yes. Every single part. And here's where I'm going with this. Married men, a woman's body is a constantly changing puzzle. It is a mystery that is hard to unlock. Yeah. But you have been given the gift of a helper that can give you creativity and wisdom. See, this is it's a little awkward, but it's, it's good. I'm telling you, when you actually just say, God, Holy Spirit, you care about every part of my life. Holy Spirit, would you actually help me be creative to understand whatever? I am telling you, yeah. it works. It's powerful. And it's, it's an amazing thing when you actually invite God in. Instead of saying, God, you're a part of every part of my life. But when me and my wife go in here, I'm shutting the door. You just hang out out there. I don't need you. No. 
God is a part of everything and there's strength in that. And if you embrace that mindset that it's not weird or creepy, it is powerful and it is a blessed thing, amazing things can come from that. And so that's just a practical tip as well that married men can take. But Proverbs 5, 17 to 19 says, may your fountain, your sex life be blessed by God. May you, true, may you know true joy with the wife of your youth. She who is lovely as a deer and graceful as a doe, as you drink in her love, may her breast satisfy you at all times. I love the Bible. <laughs> oh. So to sum all this up, if you are single, I wanna encourage you, wait to have sex and glorify God. If you are married, I wanna encourage you, have sex and glorify God. Because glorifying God just means acknowledging his greatness, living his way, honoring God with your life and with your choices. That's what we're doing. And we can bring honor to God. We can honor God with our bodies in this area. And you know what, if you've done great in this area, maybe you're a, a single person and you are, you're waiting and you're making certain commitments, awesome, thank God. Or maybe you're in a great marriage and you've, you've set some very healthy boundaries and you don't have a lot of regrets, thank God. Because, but recognize that wasn't you. It's not you were just some super person or super Christian. God worked alongside you to build something great. But maybe you're here and it's like, I have regrets and I haven't done it maybe the way God would want me to do it. I hope today that you do not feel condemned, but rather allow the conviction of God that it, it sometimes, again, it's that hurt, that pain that's like, ugh, it's tough to realize I, I did this or whatever. But God's saying in the middle of that, he's saying, I, I want you to feel the pain of it to know that you're better than this and I've got something better for you and I wanna give it to you. And that is what God wants for us today because there's no wound too great that Jesus can't heal. There's no sin too great that he can't forgive. There's no uh, conversation so delicate that his wisdom cannot speak to it. Whatever that is, God wants to be a part. And the beauty of the good news of Jesus is that when you are at your worst, he loved you first. Whether you're in your worst right now, whether you can't stop thinking about your worst and you, it, it, the pain of it, he loved you first and he is right there right now saying, come to me. I have something amazing for you because when we say yes to Jesus in every part of our lives, we receive freedom, we receive power and blessing and, and life. And God wants to care about every single part of your life. Why don't we all stand up as we wrap up today? It's so important for us to realize that yes, we targeted a specific area, and God does care about this area. And I hope that you see that in a fresh new way or more than you have before. But God cares about every single part of your life because he cares about you. Where you are right now, regardless of how you got here, God just sees who you can be and who you truly are. And I wanna invite you to pray with us today to make that decision, to respond to God's love and what he's offering and say, I want that. I wanna be in relationship with Jesus because that's the only relationship. When we prioritize that passion towards God, it will bleed into every part of your life and it will be the best decision that you can make. And so I wanna invite you to close your eyes and just invite you to join us as we pray, asking God to lead our lives. And so why don't we just say, Jesus, thank you for the power of what you've done. The perfect life you lived, the death that you paid to take away my sin and shame and for coming back to life to give me new life. I receive your life today and I wanna follow you. I place my life in your hands. I trust you, God. And the passion inside of me, I will make you my priority. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, I just also want to just take a moment. I want to pray for the singles and I want to pray for the married people in here because I believe after something like this, it stirs up stuff, good or bad. <laughs> Things come to the surface and I know that God's got something so good for all of us, not just from a Sunday morning, but where it's going to go. And so God, I thank you for every single person in here. Uh, God, wherever they're at in, in relationship status or just where, they're, where they are in, in life, God, I thank you that you are empowering them 
to make you their priority when it comes to the passion that burns in them in whatever capacity that looks like. God, I thank you that you're giving strength. You're giving direct wisdom uh, and even just creativity on how to walk that road, whether it's being single for their whole life or, or just for a season, God, that they would place their focus on you and you're gonna bring out good things in that. Lord, I also pray for, for married people here today. God, marriages that maybe are hurting or going through difficult seasons and even talking about sex, is it just stirs up things that aren't great. God, I thank you that you are bigger than the pain uh, of what we've experienced and you can bring healing as they have maybe tough conversations or, or make changes, even if it's only one-sided at first, working on it. God, I thank you that you are bringing strength and vitality to marriages in brand new ways, even for those who have strong marriages, that you would just take it to a whole nother level, that we could continue to be your light through even this relationship to the world around us that is so broken. God, I thank you for the way you're going to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I just want to encourage you as we wrap up with that one final verse, Colossians 1, 9, it says this, it says, Father, may they clearly know your will and achieve the height and depth of spiritual wisdom and understanding in bed. <laughs> we hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the Next Step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. And we look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.